Happy Sunday, everyone. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Woo! I, I was actually surprised by the weather uh, on our way here. It was. Uh, it turns out to the sun's out and it's a beautiful uh, Seattle weather. So I just want to thank you for tuning in this morning. Uh, I want to just uh, jump into the word because um, we have uh, a lot of things to talk about today and also we're going to prepare our hearts for the uh, Holy Communion this morning. Amen. Uh, this week as the Lord spoke uh, you know, about what I'm going to share with you today, I want you to know whether you are, uh, you have been a Christian for all of your life or you are just trying to figure out this Christian thing. Uh, there are many people who misunderstood Christianity as a relationship with Jesus. Uh, I remember talking to several people who have been burned by churches uh, and religion because of the legalism in their religion. Uh, none of them have the security and confidence in their salvation. And they thought that salvation is earned to a pilgrimage of rituals and good behaviors, right? Uh, and the message they heard centered around what not to do, what to do, what you must do in order to find favors with God. And their focus is only avoiding those mistakes and violating the laws of God and the church. But that is not the gospel, guys. That is not the gospel. If our focus is centered around the things that we must do and we must not do, and our focus is very sin-centered, and our focus is on our behavior, then that is not the gospel. We, we misunderstood uh, the, the call and the, and the invitation that Jesus wants you and me to have in this relationship, right? How many of you have ever told your kids or have been told, uh, maybe as kids, Hey, don't touch the fire. Hey, don't touch the electrical outlets. Or don't touch the fireplace. How many of you have been told that? And how many of you have also been heard? Hey, not, don't do those things. Don't look at those things, right? And guess what? The moment you heard those words, what, what did you guys do? You do it. <laughs> you touch it. You see it. Right? And that is just human nature in our fallen state is that we are curious, you know, and the word forbidden sounds so sensational. Whenever you have the word forbidden, it sounds like so attractive that you want to do it, right? Um, and then how many of you have been told not to look at those stuffs? You know, those stuffs are not good for you. And guess what? The next thing you turn around, you look at those stuffs. So that's basically. We as a human being, we are just a curious being. We always try to focus on things that we are not supposed to. Uh, and therefore, that's how our Christianity becomes a burden to many of us, right? Let me ask you this question. Uh, let me ask you, let me begin this sermon by asking you this question. How many laws did God give when he first created Adam? How many laws did God give when he created Adam? Any one of you want to guess in this room? Shout out your answer. Huh? Oh, yeah. So only one law, right? Which is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. It says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any trees of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So God gave us, or God gave Adam one law. And guess what? Guess what? Adam could not even keep one law. And then, and then God gave Moses, of course, the famous Ten Commandments, right? But the religious leaders, such as the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, felt that the people are straying away from God, and they came up with more laws to govern the Ten Commandments. So they have laws for laws. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Right? In the end, there are 613 laws to govern the Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's how crazy the world has become. You know, that people that, you know, are so burdened by the laws that they have laws for the laws. They have rules to, uh, to govern the laws. That's simply crazy. Now, let me ask you, uh, to those of you who are tuning in from the United States, how many laws, total laws, are there in the United States? Any one of you want to guess? You want the answer? Uh, too many. 
too many laws, okay? And here are some funny ones. Let's begin with the real, uh, the Washington state law first, okay? Uh, and I think this is very relevant to today's uh, uh, season in, during pandemic. Uh, in the RCW, which is the Washington State Law, law Code, in RCW 70.54.050, it says that no person may walk in, about in public if he or she has the common code. Actually, there is a law. You can, you can type it in, RCW 70.54.050. There is a law that you are not supposed to walk in public if you have a common code. Here's another one. This is uh, also a Seattle municipal uh, law, uh, which is 12A.12.040. It says that one may not spit on a bus. <laughs> Sounds like a Singaporean law, actually. But Seattle also have that law. Okay? And, and uh, here's, here's another one. A law to reduce crime states. It is mandatory for a motorist with criminal intention to stop at the city limits and telephone the city chief of police as he's entering the town. <laughs> this is a crazy law. And here's another one, our favorite IRS law. It says, if you steal a property, you must report its fair market value in your income tax in the year you steal it. Unless in the same year, you return it to the rightful owner. And that is IRS Law Publication 17. <laughs> and here's another law from our dear IRS. Same, Publication 17 also. If you receive a bride, include it in your income tax for the year. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> but, the, but the Bible said that the law brings a curse. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, it says that the written law kills, but the Spirit of God gives life. So why did the law bring curse? So I want to let you tune in to Romans chapter 7. If you have your Bible or you can uh, read together in the, in the YouTube, uh, what do you call that? The, the, the ticker at the bottom, the orange, shiny, bright ticker. Yeah. <laughs> Romans chapter 7 verse 10 to 12. This is... The Apostle Paul, this is one of my favorite verse in the Bible, Romans chapter 7, written by Paul. And I, I'm going to read it, of course, you guys can, can guess it, right? In the MSG version, right? It says this, The law code started out as an excellent piece of work. What happened though, was that sin found a way to pervert the command into a temptation, making a piece of forbidden fruit out of it. The law code, instead of being used to guide me, was used to seduce me. Without all of the paraphernalia of the law code, sin looked pretty dull and lifeless. And I went along without paying much attention to it. But once sin got its hand on the law code and decked itself out in all of that finery, I was full and I fell for it. The very command that was supposed to guide me into life was cleverly used to trip me up, throwing me headlong. So sin was plenty alive and I was stoned dead. But the law code itself is God's good and common sense. Each command, sin and holy counsel. The law is not our enemy, guys. The law wasn't intended to be given to you as an enemy. As something that you need to stay away from it. It's not something that will actually uh, bring death to you. But the law actually is to help you. The law was created as a good and sane counsel for you. So that the law can actually guide you to, towards a savior. That's the goal of the law. The law wasn't given to you and to me for us to fulfill it. Right? How many of you can fulfill the law? Come on guys, be honest. Right? No matter how holy you are. Whether you are a pastor, you are leaders, or you have been uh, 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 a Christian for all of your life, I bet you that you have not kept all of the laws that are around you. Correct? Adam has one law, and he couldn't even keep it. The, the, uh, the Israelites have ten laws, and they couldn't even keep it. And then the Pharisee and Sadducees now added 613 laws, and I bet you they couldn't keep it too. And now here in the United States, we have too many laws, and I bet you as also cannot keep it, right? 
The law wasn't given to you and to me for us to, to fulfill it. But the law was given to us to tell you that we cannot. We cannot. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot fulfill the law ourselves. Therefore, the law was supposed to point to a Savior. That's the purpose. A good friend of mine, you know, I still remember uh, many years ago when I was younger in Singapore, uh, they, one day they, the, the government just come up with a law that prohibit you from uh, eating bubble gum. Okay, chewing gum. When I was much younger, you can eat chewing gum in Singapore. But at one point, uh, I forgot what year was that, they suddenly have a law that says no chewing gum. You know, I never liked chewing gum in the, in the first place. I don't, even have, I don't even care about a chewing gum. But the moment they have that law, suddenly I want to eat chewing gum. <laughs> and I try ways to buy chewing gum. You know, they are friends from Malaysia, they are friends from uh, Indonesia, Thailand, when they come in. We always, you know, the Singaporean always ask them, hey, bring some chewing gum for us, <laughs> you know. And then one day, I still remember, I, I had a friend who visited, and then uh, she or he brought the chewing gum. I don't like chewing gum, but because the law says I can't eat chewing gum, I want to eat it. <laughs> and so I, I took the chewing gum from a friend, you know, a bunch of us, you know, after church, we were walking in a, in a mall uh, with the chewing gum, and the police actually caught us. I thought that was a joke, you know. I thought that was a joke. I thought they will not, you know, arrest us. And then the police approached us, and then the police approached my friend first. He said, hey, are you eating chewing gum? And I knew I was in trouble. So I quickly swallowed my chewing gum. Okay? <laughs> I quickly swallowed my chewing gum. My friend, she, she got a warning, $50 fine. Okay? Yeah, $50 fine. So isn't it funny? We as a human, you know, we actually sometimes don't like those things that are harmful for us maybe or the, there's nothing. Chewing gum, I never like it. I never, I seldom eat it. I, I don't care about chewing gum. But when the law was given, suddenly the law becomes, a, 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 you know, something in our fallen nature turns the law into a temptation and then into something that we desire. Isn't that weird? A friend of mine, this is a few years back, uh, tell me this great illustration. He says the law is like a mirror. The law is like a mirror. It shows you who you are. It even shows you what you did wrong, but it can never wipe away your wrong. The mirror can tell the girls, like, oh, the lipsticks on your teeth, or, you know, maybe there is something wrong with your makeup, but the law, the mirror cannot wipe away those problems. The, the law can only tell you what's wrong with you, but the law can never save you or clean you. The law is a mirror. The law is supposed to, be a, to give us a reflection of a Savior. Okay? The law will not lead us in, unto salvation. The law will lead us unto a Savior. Are you listening, guys? The law will not lead us unto salvation, but the law will lead us unto a Savior. God gave us the law to guide us to the truth. The law wasn't meant to be a burden, even though sometimes... Uh, we as churches or we as, un, uh, as believers or religious leaders, we make the law as a burden to the people in such a way that the law become a prerequisite for their salvation. The law become a prerequisite for their relationship with Jesus. But actually, God gave us the law to lead us and to guide us into the truth with capital T. Who is the truth? Jesus is the truth, right? Jesus is full of truth and full of grace. And to show us that we cannot fulfill the law ourselves. We just don't have the, the character in us to fulfill every single law. Right? The law was supposed to tell us that we are sinners. That we are helpless in need of a savior. The law point us to the person of Jesus. That is the function of the law. But unfortunately, and I know, because we encounter a number of people even in 2020 that was so burnt out, that was so burdened. Uh, there's one uh, guy who said that, oh yeah, I, I, uh, I'm in between religion. Why? Oh, because there's just so much burden being a part of a church. There's too much legalism in a church. 
And I said, that's not the gospel though. That is not the gospel, right? Because the gospel is never meant to burden you. The gospel was never meant to burn you out, right? The law was given, yeah, as a guiding post for you. The law wasn't meant to burden you. If you are burdened by the law, that means you are reading it all wrong, right? Because the law should point us to the person of Jesus. Let's continue reading verse 13. Okay, Romans 7 verse 13. I really love these several verses, this whole chapter of Romans 17, uh, Romans chapter 7. If you read it in the message, it's going to give you such a wonderful revelation about your relationship with Jesus. Verse 13. I can already hear your next question. Does that mean that I can't even trust what is good? That is the law? Is good just as dangerous as evil? No, again. Sin simply did what sin is so famous for doing. Using the good as a cover to tempt me to do what will finally destroy me. The law was not our, it's not our enemy. Sin is our enemy. And sin manipulate the law to tempt you and destroy you. Continue reading, okay? By hiding within God's good commandment, sin did far more mischief than it could ever have accomplished on its own. Verse 14. I can anticipate the response that is coming from all of you. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? This is Paul talking, not me, okay? I know it sounds like I'm the one talking, but this is Paul writing. Yes, I'm full of myself after all. I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand though about myself is that I decided one way, but then I act another way. Doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. How many of you have that, that desire in you? I need something more. For I know the law, but still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. How many of you think that way? I obviously need help. I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can do it. I decided to do good, but I don't really do it. How many of you feel the same way, right? Sometimes it's like that. You know what is good for you, but you don't do it, right? I don't want to give example because I still have a lot to read, okay? Let's continue reading. Uh, uh, where am I? I decided not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Some Thing has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. Verse 21, it happens so regular. Listen guys, this is the Apostle Paul. He was already an apostle when he wrote this. So he was, he had relationship with Jesus. He know who Jesus is, but this is his struggle. And I don't want you to be embarrassed or ashamed of your struggle. You know, sometimes when we became Christian for so long, and when we have challenges and when we have issues in our lives, we were so embarrassed and ashamed to, to share or to, to find help because we thought that as a Christians, we, we need to have it all together. We need to be perfect, right? And if something wrong with us, then we are too ashamed to find help. No, guys, listen. If you need help, you need help, okay? Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Reach out to those who can help you. So verse 21, Apostle Paul said this, it happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. It sounds like when you want to go for a diet, you know, like part of me wants to have the diet, but not all of me takes in that delight. That's, therefore, I still can't lose weight. Okay? <laughs> Part of me covertly rebel just when I least expected it. They take charge. Sin take charge. Verse 24. I've tried 
everything and nothing helps. I don't know how many of you tuning in today is shouting that same uh, uh, cry. He said, I have tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm at the end of my life. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? See, the good thing about Paul is that he did not say, how do I overcome this? And what must I do to overcome this? But the question that Paul asked, and you need to ask that same question is, is there no one who can help me? Who can help me? So you, you're tuning in from home here during the live stream or later on at the recorded message. I want you to ask the same question. I need help. I'm at the end of my rope. Who can help me? And then verse 25. Verse 25. This is such a revelation for me several years ago. He says, I've tried, you know, I've tried to become a good Christian. I tried to become perfect. I, 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 I pour out my life in, in, in doing the things that I thought it would please God. But then you become burned out. And then you become so frustrated. And then things that you are not supposed to do, you do. And then sin trip you up. The temptation are just too great. And then your whole being covertly rebel against you. And then you are at the end of the rope. And you try again. Maybe you go for more podcasts. Maybe the more podcasts you listen, the better you become. And then you become frustrated because you, it, it never changed you. It never helped you. Because the answer is not in the how. The answer is not in what you can do. The answer is in the who. Verse 25. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. It doesn't say Jesus Christ can and will. He says, Jesus Christ can and does. Present. Today, at this moment, if you ask that question and invite Jesus into your life, Jesus can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Come on, guys. Let's ask that question. Who can save me? Who can help me? Is there no one else can help me? And then verse 25, thank God. Jesus Christ can and does. Today, there is an invitation that Jesus is extending to you and to me. It's no longer about fulfilling the law. It's not longer being legalistic in your worship with Jesus but is finding in the one, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. And I have this quote. Now I kind of forget, is it me who wrote this quote or I found it somewhere else? But, but because I, I forgot to write who wrote it, but please, I don't want to take credit, but it says this, the grace of God does not command that sins be overlooked. Listen, guys, the grace of God does not mean that we overlook sin. We dumb down sin. We ignore sin. We assume that sin is nothing. No. The grace of God does not command that sin be overlooked, but the grace of God does demand that sin must be paid in full. Sin is horrendous. Sin leads you to destruction. Sin leads us to death, and it must be paid. The grace of God does not make sin disappear and overlook it and make it cheap. But the grace of God demands that sin be paid. But it wasn't paid by you. It wasn't paid by what you do. It, does not, it wasn't paid by your good behavior. But it was paid by Jesus and Jesus alone. I, 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 um, I did this study a few years back and I want to read to you an excerpt from that study. Uh, I, I forgot the title of the, the study, but this is an excerpt from that study. It says this. God is not only supremely merciful, but He is also supremely just. His justice requires, as He has revealed Himself in the Word, that the sin we committed against His infinite majesty be punished with both temporal and eternal punishment. Your sin and my sin must be be punished. 
temporal and eternal punishment of soul as well as body. We cannot escape these punishments unless satisfaction is given to God's justice, unless the, 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 the payment of sin is made in full. Okay? However, we ourselves cannot give this satisfaction or deliver ourselves from God's anger. God in His boundless mercy has given us a guarantee. His only begotten Son, Jesus, who was made to be sin and a curse for us in our place on the cross in order that He might give satisfaction for us all. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that God is just and God is merciful. He is just because He demands that your sin must be paid no matter what. There is no way you can overlook it. There is no way you can discount it. It must be paid in full measure. But God is also gracious that He did not demand you to pay it, but He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to pay it in full for you. That is the gospel, guys. So in conclusion, Maybe some of you have been Christian for a very long time and you are tired because of the burdens of the laws, the don'ts, the do's of the Christian livings, the Christian religion. Or maybe this is the first time you heard the gospel and you thought being a Christian is too much restriction and legalism. I want to invite you to be Jesus-centered rather than sin-centered. I want us as a community to be Jesus-centered rather than sin-centered. Let us draw near to Jesus and you will find rest. Jesus is inviting us to a relationship, not a religion. God wants you to know Him through the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, who paid it all for you. He is the fulfillment of the law. He is the payment of our penalty. Jesus, not through endless rituals and burdensome rules, but Jesus as a person who is inviting you to that relationship, no matter what your background, your, your story, your circumstances, He is the payment of our sin and He is the mercy of God. He loves you, He cares for you, and today He is waiting for you. Before we partake on the Holy Communion, I want to pray for those of you who wants to come. Either you are coming back to that relationship or this is your first time accepting that invitation to that relationship. I want to pray for you, would you? And after you pray this prayer, you are invited to partake on the Holy Communion with us this morning. It is a celebration, right? After I, we pray this message, we're going to give you time, go grab uh, a biscuits or uh, crackers, or a bread and a juice come back and we partake the Holy Communion together let's bow our heads to those of you who wants to receive Jesus today who wants to enter into that relationship or who is coming back into that relationship would you say this prayer with me dear Lord Jesus I acknowledge that I am a sinner in need of a Savior today Lord Jesus I ask for your forgiveness of sin and I want to invite you into my life. Jesus, you are my Lord. Jesus, you are my Savior. From today onwards, I am new. The old has passed. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross to become the payment for the penalty of our sin. From today onwards, I lean in and I rest in the power of your resurrection. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, let's take a moment here. We're going to partake on the Holy Communion. I'm going to give you just maybe 30 seconds. Go grab your bread and juice. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. I'm very excited whenever I shared about Romans chapter 7. Because in our ministry for so many years, 
we have encountered people that are so burned out by the legalism of their religion. And many have turned away from churches. Many have turned away from the communion of the brothers and sisters because they misunderstood the gospel. They misunderstood the word of God. And there are people who shy away from the grace of God because they thought it's too good to be true. And they say like, no, something must be done because I'm guilty of that sin. I need to suffer for that sin. Guys, there is nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible that you are supposed to pay for your sin by yourself. No way. There is only one and one way only. You can read it in the Bible. That your salvation and the payment of your sin is done only through His Son, Jesus Christ. So today as we partake on this Holy Communion, let us be remembered of what Jesus had done on the cross for you personally and for me. Yes, our sin is horrendous. Our sin is heavy. Our sin is devastating. But the, by the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, He paid it all. And He, you guys know, right, that sin needs to be paid by the pouring out of the blood. Even in the Old Testament, they got to be a pouring out of the blood of the Lamb. And the blood of Jesus not only covers your sin, He removes your sin. As far as the east from the west, he remember your sin no more. Let's lift this bread up. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for you uh, a merciful and just God. Your, your justice demand that sin be paid in full. But your mercy sends your son, Jesus Christ, to pay it all for us on that cross. And when you have done it all, you said, this is finished. It is completed. There is nothing more that we can add or do to earn our way to salvation. The way to this relationship and salvation is only one way. One way, which is through your Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, today, as we partake on this bread, Father God, we want to do it in remembrance of you. To those of you who are suffering right now in diseases, sicknesses, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, by his wounds, you are made well again. Let's partake this. Let's lift up the cup, would you? Father God, thank you so much, Lord, because we know that the penalty of sin must be paid with the pouring out of the blood. By, the, by death, we pay the penalty of sin. For the Word of God says the wages of sin is death. Thank you, Jesus, that we do not have to die once again because Jesus has paid all for us on that cross. His blood, His death, allow us to enter into this new covenant with you. And your blood, not only able to sanctify our sin, but is able to remove it from the east to the west. And you remember our sin no more. Today, as we drink this cup, Father God, we drink it in remembrance of you. Let's drink this cup. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for the reminder that you have given us this morning. That the good news of Jesus Christ is that we were sinners, we are hopeless, we are helpless, and we cannot pay it, whether with our good behaviors, whether with our performance and merits, whether by following all of the laws, we cannot fulfill the payment of that sin. But today, Jesus, the good news is that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that you can become the full, the full payment of our sin. 
And because of that, when we enter that relationship with Jesus, and when we declare and believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior of our life, that we can have that eternity, that eternal life with you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for opening up your arms to accept us no matter where we are in our lives, whether we are perfect, we are not perfect, whether we made mistakes, whether we have broken relationships, whether we have broken stories, Father God. You love us so much that you came down to find us, to seek for us, and to serve us, and to rescue us. Today, Father God, I pray to those of them who, are, who have received Jesus, I pray that they will continue to walk with you. And to those of us who have been walking with Jesus, allow us to be reminded that it is not by our own might, it is not by our own power, but it is by the Spirit of God that leads us into this relationship. Father God, as we depart from here, I pray that your countenance shine upon us and that you will shower us with the blessing of the Lord for you, for your children, and your children's children, and your children's children's children, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much again for uh, tuning in this morning. Again, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, subscribe it, get notification, and maybe share it with your friend who have not heard the gospel so that they too can hear and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Have a wonderful Sunday, everyone. And again, God bless you and God loves you. Amen.